was sleeping in and enjoying it. And then I realized I left my notebook at the office, so I had to go back to the office. I said, no, why am I doing this again? And I realized that, you know, I have built a number of businesses from scratch. In fact, over five companies, I've gone from zero to multi-million dollar companies. And my last two companies I took public, uh, probably the last company you've heard of, uh, AeroGrow International. And I've had the opportunity a number of times to kind of walk away from business and enjoy life, as people would say. And I realized that that's one facet of enjoying life, and another is just the creative juices that don't stop. And the other thing is I like to teach. I like to inspire. I like to see people take their ideas and make them something, and make them extraordinary. I know how to do that, and I know how I, I know that passion, and I can feel it when I'm with people that have that. And that brings out the best in me. It brings out the place in me that wants other people to succeed. So I'm back to kind of teach, inspire, and also help certain entrepreneurs raise money for their businesses. I notice I'm actually a little bit hoarse. So if I could get a water, that would be great. Mm. So today, I'm going to talk to you about how to raise money. So if you're interested in raising money, you're in the right place. Thank you very much. <coughs> As Tom mentioned, I've raised over $50 million in the last 27 years. I've gone to bat 21 times, and I've raised money all 21 times, in good times and bad times. And I have learned a method the hard way. I've learned when I went after angel funding, bank funding, VC funding, I couldn't get any of that. And I was, like maybe many of you, stuck. Uh, how do you raise money when you don't have uh, let's say two times the collateral for, for banks if you don't have a billion dollar idea for venture capitalists and if you don't know where to find angels or if you do find angels and you find one, two, three, four, you got to negotiate with each of them and it's like herding cats. One wants one kind of deal, another wants another kind of deal and it's challenging. In 1982, I faced my first fundraising challenge. I had developed a, a unique concept. Uh, and given that we only have three hours and I have three specific segments, my handlers here um, will kind of keep me on track because I can kind of elaborate sometimes and will miss some material. Uh, so I'm going to leave that be and just say I started in 1982 raising money. I raised my first million and a half dollars using an investor direct offering. That's a term I've quoted, I've actually developed. It's actually going direct to investors, uh, raising small amounts of money. By small amounts of money, I'm referring to fifteen to $75,000. My sweet spot is somewhere around $25,000. I'm going to teach you about that today. There are three segments. Each of them will be an hour. The first segment is going to be very um, intense because I've got a lot of material to cover. It's a lot of details. And I had a choice. I could have covered less or covered more. And because the topic is big and a lot of you are, are actively looking to raise money now, I'm going to try and cover as much as I can. Um, I'm going to suggest you take notes. Uh, we also have slides, and we will give you a copy of the slides at the end. Um, there'll be time for questions and answers in each of the three segments. Each segment is an hour, but the first hour will be the most intense, and that will be an hour that I will do, unfortunately, a lot of reading, because by reading it, I can get a lot said as opposed to elaborating and ad-libbing. So the first hour will be kind of me reading material to you and trying to keep eye contact as best I can. The second two hours, I'll work, there, the second hour we work on marketing, and that's a vital part of fundraising. How do you 
find investors and get them to either individual sessions or group sessions. And so I'll be passing out some materials and I'll be talking through that and we'll have some engagement there. And the third session will be about presentation. I'll actually do uh, talk to you about the AeroGrow presentation where I raised $5 million through individual investors. I'll take you through a slide presentation and actually hand out the slide presentation to you. But just expect the first segment to be dense and intense, but we will have time for Q&As. So I'm going to go to my little podium here. So I have worked this system over and over again through trial and error, and I've refined a system that absolutely has worked for me consistently. It's a method that is proven and repeatable. You can use it almost immediately, and it dramatically raises your chance of, chances of getting funding. So, at, like you, I've faced the need for raising capital. I've also had a number of successes in my life, and I've had failures in my life. In fact, uh, my very first company, uh, I failed because I ran out of money. Uh, I started my first company when I was 20, 21 years old in, in St. Petersburg, Florida, expanded the business. It became one of the larger um, carpet chains on the west coast of Florida, St. Petersburg area, I overexpanded, went out of business. If I would have had the funds, I would not have gone out of business. Learned an important lesson, more than just funding. I learned a few things about accounting and profit and loss and other kinds of things also. I've also raised money for other companies. A um, number of years ago, you may have remembered, uh, if you remember some of my ads uh, back, uh, the. 2000, 2001, 2002, I had a company called MentorCap where I, I helped entrepreneurs raise money. One of those was Jomi Safety Ladders. We did a direct public offering with them, raised a million and a half dollars in less than 100 days. Uh, I retired from AeroGrow about a year ago and um, enjoyed working on, I have a small, I, I, I live on a small lake and uh, called Lake of the Pines, and I worked on my home, my wife and I, and I spent time relaxing, and just after having done that a few times, you'd think I would have learned that retirement isn't my thing, so I came out of retirement, as Rocky has done a number of times, and now I'm helping the next generation of entrepreneurs raise money to help them fund their businesses. Uh, I'm now on the radio, if you listen to 760 or 630 or 850, de depending on your political persuasion, I'm, uh, I'm all, all across the map there. Um, but I'm now advertising about helping entrepreneurs raise money. I just recently took on a um, exciting client, Maestro Conference. It's an advanced conferencing kind of uh, client that I'm helping them do an investor direct offering. So I'm going to start with some of the common fundraising errors. Uh, these are things that many of you um, may have done or are in the process of doing. Hopefully, this will keep you from making those same errors. The first, not being prepared for fundraising. You know, we get, I'm getting calls all the time with people who want to fundraise and they think, oh, I just need the money and that's it. And that may be true, but whether it's myself or anyone, you just don't pull a rabbit out of the hatch. You have to be prepared for fundraising. There are certain kind of substantiations to your claims. There's a, there's a marketing methodology. Things are needed. So entrepreneurs often start... Um, their invest start to raise money and their story has not been matured yet. And you'll hear more about that today. Most entrepreneurs 
uh, think it's about the business plan and the facts, and they put a lot of time and energy in kind of developing the right business plan and, and find out that, you know, that's helpful to get your story together, but most of raising money is marketing and selling. Two thirds of it is marketing and selling and it's not about your business plan. So, there is something that I've coined called investor perceived value that we're gonna talk about. And it's how do you create that? What is the components of that? And it has to do with the facts, the story, the positioning, and your credibility. And we'll get into that, but that's, those four components are vital to raising money. Another problem that entrepreneurs kind of walk into, kind of a trap, is they attempt to raise too much money the first time around. So they want to raise two million or five million, and they don't realize that part of fundraising is creating a certain momentum and creating the aura of invincibility. That whatever you're gonna do, you're gonna do it well and you're gonna succeed at. And if you start with trying to raise $5 million, boy, there's a series of problems with that that I'll cover. One of which is you can't create momentum trying to raise that amount of money. So I have developed a system of raising smaller chunks of money incrementally, declaring a win, and then raising the next round. Number five, which is similar, not understanding the strategy of, a strategy of staged fundraising. And staged fundraising, not only, help, it only, not only does it create momentum, but it gives you enough cash to fight the next battle of raising money. So raising money is for those of you who will be successful, either or are successful or will be successful, you'll find that raising money is about staged campaigns where you get some money and that money helps you build part of your business and it helps you build part of your story for your next round of fundraising. Number six, the wrong type of offering structure. Many, you know, many people go into the battlefield of fundraising with the wrong structure. And that wrong structure doesn't allow you to go after a wide range of investors that I have termed virgin investors. I've also have something called adventure investors. These are categories of people that you can only go after in an, with an investor direct offering. Number seven, which is, as any of us that have fundraised know, investors are, have this aura of, oh yeah, I like your deal. Oh, it's good. You know, I, I'm, I'm going to make a decision soon. I just have to check with my attorney or a check with this advisor or something, but I'll get back with you in the next few days. And those few days go to weeks and go to months. And so you find that you don't get closure with investors. They all feel excited and they, you know, it's right around the corner and it doesn't happen. And the bigger the investor, the bigger the investor, the bigger the challenge. And that's why I don't, I no longer go after big investors because they, they have you. You know, there's no expression. Those with the gold make the rules. So I've developed a strategy, a closing strategy that doesn't require you to sell. It doesn't require you to be a salesman or have to hammer someone, but a method that's built into the prospectus and into my presentation that has allowed me 95% of the investors I pitch within say the last 10 years I have gotten decisions within five working days. I'm gonna show you a technique that's absolutely amazing. It's simple to implement, but vital for any investment campaign. So the objectives today, what are, thank you, investor direct offerings, how to use them to fund your company. Number two, who are the highest probability investors? How to find them? 
how to create a compelling marketing campaign to make sure you get in front of a sufficient number of investors to close your deal, how to create a powerful and compelling sales presentation, and how to get quick decisions on your investments without being pushy or coming across as a salesman. The last few years have seen two of the most dramatic changes in how businesses can raise capital since the early 1980s. The first is the banking collapse and subsequent credit crunch along with the severe downturn of the financial markets and the erosion of wealth have created a formidable barrier to companies seeking funding. That's a mouthful. Now banks, venture capitalists, capitalists and angels are far less likely to invest in startups or existing businesses that, than they have been in years. So that's a big barrier to entry for raising money. The good news, in order to stimulate investments in entrepreneurial companies, certain state regulations and federal mandates handed down by the SEC have made it possible to advertise and sell stock directly to individual investors. These new regulations are making a major difference in the way companies can raise money. Just as the Obama campaign illustrated that it was possible to raise millions of dollars from individuals rather than rely on large corporate donors, entrepreneurs can now raise large sums of money from many small investors in the ten dollars to $30,000 range. Furthermore, the ability to advertise direct to the public has changed the fundraising landscape, making it possible for both startups and existing companies to raise money without having to resort to banks, venture capitalists, or investment bankers. So we talked about it. Traditionally, banks want collateral or they want a profitable company. And if you're either a startup or you're an emerging growth company that's on the brink of of profitability, banks aren't going to happen for you. Venture capitalists are absolutely the toughest nut to crack when you're raising money. It's estimated that less than 1 in 10,000 deals are funded. The average deal size in 2008 was $11 million, which means entrepreneurs in the half a million to $2 million range are, just worth, are not worth their time. Venture capitals generally require a lot of due diligence. They want a, generally a, a, a seat on the board, sometimes two. They take a large equity stake, and they demand a lot of concessions. If performance milestones aren't met, you're in trouble. There's like 10 different ways venture capitals have entrepreneurs for dinner. So this is, you know, they make their living dealing with us, and we don't make our living dealing with them. We don't even see it coming. And probably one of the biggest challenges is that, first, they're holding out this large amount of money, so it's kind of all in one, one place. If I can just get that two or three million dollars or more, and boy, that solves my problem. And they have you, with sweet talking you, about oh, this is right up our sweet spot, this is good, and th they get you close and personal, oh, we just need a little more due diligence, a little more time, a little more time, and meanwhile, many things could be happening. First of all, you could be sweating bullets because you need the money, and they know you need the money. Now, I'm not saying they're malicious, but they know how to play the game. And you have to know how to play the game also. And venture capitalists generally is not the place you want to play the game with. You're dealing with sophisticated investors, and there is much easier game in town. Angels. Angels have become bigger in the landscaping environment from, say, the early 2000s. But with the market collapse in October, angel funding has <laughs> just kind of sucked in, and although it didn't go dry, it's very difficult. In addition, angels are also very sophisticated investors, and they have a due diligence process. You end up playing by their rules. They're the ones with the money, 
and they're the ones that kind of control the theater of operations, if you will. So due diligence, level, they ask for many levels of due diligence, and again, if you're dealing with multiple ones, each one wants their own deal, it's also hard to find. Fortunately, for entrepreneurs, there's a whole new group of investors willing to invest in entrepreneurial companies. And these are investors that have not been targeted in the past. And I call these adventure investors, affinity investors, and virgin investors. They represent a pool of investors that haven't been tapped, a huge source of funds, they're much easier to sell and less time consuming to close than angels or VCs. They have a number of different characteristics. First, these type of investors, to begin with, I generally pool or pull from a pool of 30 million investors which have invested in microcap stocks. And a microcap stock is considered stocks that are less than 200. $50 million. And those are higher risk, potentially higher reward investors. Unless you're doing an investor direct offering, you can't go after those because many of those investors are unaccredited investors. With investor direct offerings, and I'll define that soon, you are able to advertise directly to investors whether uh, sophisticated investors, accredited investors, or unaccredited investors, you can go after all of them. So it's a brand new pool of investors. And these are not investors that have been approached generally by private companies. A, because private companies couldn't advertise to them. I call virgin investors any investor that has never um, invested in a private company. I define angels as any individual who has invested in two or more private companies. After they've invested in two or more private companies, they become much more sophisticated and they then start putting people through a process. You've got to go through their process. Where adventure investors Virgin investors, affinity investors, again, definition coming. I'm starting to do that now. Uh, those have not been put through. They haven't learned to put, in, to put entrepreneurs through a process, so you control the theater of operations. So when I sell to those type of investors, I'm doing a presentation, and m the presentation is on my pace. It's my process. They can ans ask questions at that time, but they don't put me through a due diligence process, you know, and I, my decisions are made within five working days. So I'm going to teach you about that. Also, these type of investors tend to make decisions that um, have a lot of, do I like the company, do I like the person, do I like the idea? So there's a lot of emotion in the adventure investor decision-making process where the further you go up the scale of sophistication, like angels and venture capitals, it becomes more by the numbers. And you end up in a numbers game, and you end up in a due diligence game, and you lose the flavor. They, they don't get the flavor of the possibilities of your company, they're looking at spreadsheets. Now, that's not always. Angels have emotions too, and angels make decisions around do they like you and they like the company. But the further up the, la up the layer of how many deals they've invested in, the more and more it gets down to the numbers. Uh, the general adventure investor are 50 years of age and older. The vast majority are male. Some of the most prized adventure investors are doctors, dentists, entrepreneurs, business owners, sales and marketing professionals. All of those kind of fall in that same group. Affinity investors 
are investors that have some relationship to your company in some way. Either they know you or your team or your company or your products or your industry or your business cause. Somehow they have some relationship to any of those. They can be from your family, employees, past investors, customers, anyone with an interest in your company. The closer the affinity or the higher interest in you and your company, the better the prospect. And I will use some examples a little later on. And when you cross adventure investors, which are these higher risk 30 million investors that invest in high risk um, public companies, and you cross pollinate them with affinity investors, which are people that have some interest in your cause, your company, your products, you, your management team, something that connects the dots. When you cross pollinate those two, and I'll share how, then you have a very powerful investor, to, invest, investor pool to pull from. I've spent my, my fundraising career marketing to these type of investors. So throughout this boot camp, I'm going to share tips to find and close these type of investors. Just a little background on investor direct offerings. Beginning in the 1990s, the Security and Exchange Commission began deregulating aspects of the public markets to improve small business access to capital. One of the biggest things that happened in 1992, the SEC passed the Small Business Initiatives Act. That gave small businesses the ability to raise up to $5 million in the public markets without <coughs> having to resort to investment bankers. So for the first time, in the same way that back in the 80s, the whole 80s and 90s, the broker-dealer world started getting deregulated, so instead of having to buy stocks, from a broker-dealer, you could buy stocks directly online to the internet. And all of a sudden, transparency started to happen, and, and now investors <coughs> could bypass those traditional forms of investing or buying stocks. And the SEC followed suit, and incrementally, from 1992 until as recently as last year, many different regulations have been passed that have allowed easier and quicker access to go direct to investors. And so 1992 was the big point. Then in the 19, uh, 1995, 1996, the SEC began allowing prospectuses to be delivered over the internet. And in 1996, the very first company did an internet direct public offering called Spring Street Brewery. They raised a million and a half dollars using a direct public offering. Now, that was not the first company that did a direct public offering. Uh, a couple that you may have, uh, well, the, this goes back to the 50s. Data General actually did a direct public offering in the 1950s. They raised millions of dollars. Their salesmen went door to door and sold their stock. In, 19, in the 1980s, I think it was 1982, 83, 84, Ben and Jerry went public with a direct public offering. They had little stock offerings with their ice cream, and they raised a couple of times, two to, uh, truth is I don't remember in fact if we get the exact numbers, it was two to four million dollars just by putting little certificates in uh, and selling their stock that way. But it was 1996, that Spring Street Brewery opened the doors to something called direct public offerings. From that point on until now, there's been approximately 2,700 companies that have done direct public offerings, and most of you have probably not even heard that term. It's like an under-the-radar method of raising money direct from investors. 1996 opened the gates. 
And then in 2001, September 11, 2001, the gates closed. The whole public market dried up after 9-11. You had three things that happened in those years. As you know, the peak of NASDAQ was March of 2000. And so NASDAQ started going down. So you had a NASDAQ incremental collapse. You had 9-11 and you had the Enron scandals. And all of those just kind of destroyed the market for two or three years. And the whole public markets went to hell in a handbasket. And that include direct public offerings. And then direct public offerings kind of went off the radar screen. Like if you Google direct public offerings, you'll see, yeah, a company here and a company there. But from about 1996 to 2001, 70% of the direct public offerings were done, and then maybe 30% have been done in the last number of years. It's almost like, you know, it got a lot of excitement, then the markets collapsed, nobody was raising money, and then all of a sudden when the market started opening again, people, for, you know, their institutional memory forgot about direct public offerings. That's the business I'm in, how to help people find money using direct public offerings. There are two different types of direct public offerings. Or, excuse me, let me restate that. There are two different kinds of investor direct offerings. That's a little different than direct public offerings. Many of you don't know, but you can actually advertise using a 504 or 505 or 506. Those are private placements. Um, I'll cover them a little more in detail shortly. But with those types, you can actually advertise direct to investors if you have a pre-existing relationship, particularly if you have customers. Now, for startups, that's kind of out of the question. But you can go to family, you can go to friends, you can network. Uh, and with anyone you do have a pre-existing relationship with, you so for example, uh, you can, if you had a previous company and you have their mailing list, you can advertise to them. So that's a quick way of getting quick cash without going through the next level, which is registering your offering. So two different types of investor direct offerings. There are unregistered direct public or unregistered offerings, which is what I've just talked about, 504, 505, 506. And by the way, all you have to do is file the paperwork to the state, and after you've raised your first amount of money, you file it with the SEC. But it's a filing only. No one reviews it. It does not require an attorney. I have done many of them without attorneys. In fact, I've developed a piece of software as part of our services. That piece of software allows you to do private placements and direct public offerings right off the software, so it's a paint-by-numbers process. But with or without the software, you can still do your own private placement. Find two or three, and you can use, um, you can use those as templates. I have my handlers over here. If you'll see them, you'll put up uh, little signs telling me to do things. It means I'm running a little late. So I'm moving to the next slides. So offerings. Uh, some of the benefits of investor direct offerings. You can offer direct to the uh, public. It includes private placements, uh, which are unregistered offerings, and it includes direct public offerings, which are registered offerings. It allows you to advertise. It allows you to offer stock, debt, convertible debt, or royalties. And I'll talk you through each of those. It doesn't require an underwriter. It's, these are exempt from SEC registrations as long as the company remains unlisted and under 500 investors. So it means you can avoid a lot of paperwork and even the registrations for a direct public offering are relatively easy. You can, you can often get them done within two to three weeks and get them filed. And you can generally get responses back within two to three weeks. Some of the other benefits. You can use these in tough economic times because if you have a great story you're only asking for ten to twenty five thousand dollars sometimes more people even in tough times will invest small amounts of money if there's a possibility of a home run and uh, there's two terms for that the lotto effect and a story stock the lotto effect is 
you've got a story that is exciting and has the possibility of being an absolute home run. People in all economic conditions will invest small amounts of money for big possible upsides. Sometimes the worse the economic conditions, the better, because they've lost so much money, they, they need a home run to get back to whole. So if you have that kind of story stock, you are a prime prospect to do a direct public offering. Uh, by the way, another big benefit with direct public offering is you're not dealing with valuation issues. With angels or VCs, you're back and forth on valuation. With investor direct offerings, this is the, you choose the valuation and they're either in or they're out. And vast majority of times, I can think, I've been in front of investors somewhere between three and 10,000 investors over the last 25 years. I might have had five ask me about valuation. It's just, you know, when you're with angels, that's a big story, or VCs. It's not a big story with the average investor. So the valuation doesn't come up, and you, know, it's, you have to choose something that feels right, and if you are questioned, you have to be able to justify it. But if I were to tell you some of my valuations, uh, they are shockingly high, and I was able to sell them, and people made money with my companies. Uh, investor direct offerings are far quicker investor decisions. Again, we'll talk about that in no back and forth negotiations. What is a private placement? It's, as I mentioned, 504, 505, 506. Um, they're often used in early rounds of funding. They're quick, easy, and low cost, no oversight. And you can advertise with pre-existing relationships, but in most states you can only sell 35 non-accredited investors. Um, these are some comparisons. A 504, you can raise up to a million, a 505 up to 5 million, and a 506 uh, unlimited. Direct public offerings, um, they're unknown to most people. They open up an untapped pool of virgin investors can advertise. I personally have liked sales letters, uh, postcards, and newspapers, but you can also advertise online. Unlimited number of non-accredited investors you can take in generally takes less than 30 days for a state to review. And attorney's fees, you can actually, there is no legal there is no legal requirement for you to use an attorney on a direct public offering. So you can do it and have them review it. There is one legal requirement before you file, which is the attorney has to say that your stock can be sold, meaning there's one legal requirement. Other than that, there's not. I'm not saying don't use an attorney, but part of the reason we develop software is so you can bypass the vast majority of attorney's fees. Nevertheless, DPOs can be done quickly and cheaply. There are what's called a score offering. You can use those in 43 states. That allows you to raise up to a million dollars. There's something called an intrastate offering, which allows you to raise as much as you want. There's a Reg A that allows you to raise five million. And then there's a federal registration. Well, actually, Reg A and S1s are federal, which there's no limit. Now, yeah, so how about if we, let's start with Q&As. Um, anybody have some questions you'd like to ask? And I have to, I've been coached that I have to repeat the question, so what about a Reg D? Reg D is actually a 504, 505, 506. So that is called a Reg D or interspaced with 504, you know. So uh, those are considered private placements. You can advertise to uh, pre-existing relationships. You don't have to get approval. It's a great fundraising vehicle to start with. Um, what about corporate investors? So companies, for, exa for example, let's say you have a product um, that is a method of fast routing of something. I'm making this up. You could go to Cisco as an example or different companies. So how do you raise money from corporate investors? 
basically wherever your particular niche is, A, you find a group, you find, you do the research to find who in that niche would be possible candidates. And you do a direct marketing campaign. You go right to the CEO and you go right to the chairman of the board. You do a, a next day delivery, have to sign for it to the CEO and the uh, chairman of the board with what your proposition is and say, I'd love to talk to you. Get in front of the right kind of people. That's how I would approach it. Um, did an SB, what happened to the SBs? There was something called an SB1 and SB2 up till two years ago. Two years ago, SB1s and SB2s went away and got replaced by an S1, and they simplified some of the paperwork for the SB offerings and made the S1 in some way simpler than the SBs. Even though, a little more complicated, the SB offerings were meant to be simpler way back when, Subsequent, so now S1s, SBs have been uh, merged with S1s. There are no longer any SB offerings. I think I'm going to take both of those because there was a part question that you asked, Brian, or if you didn't ask it, I'm going to say it. Let me make a distinction now between um, a direct public offering and what I'm also calling investor direct offerings. Okay. Investor direct offerings, I lump both private placements and direct public offerings together because you are able to go after individual investors. So it's a bigger lang it's a bigger category. Investor direct offerings include private placements and they include direct public offerings. And so sometimes I'll use the word investor direct offering because both of those allow you to go after individual investors. The Private placement allows you to advertise to pre-existing relationships, and it's, and it's easy to get to, you could be selling it in 10 days from now. I mean, you can be up and running very quickly. A direct public offering takes a little longer, and you have to go through a process of getting it approved by the state, but that's a relatively quick process. So that's, number, that's the first category I want to make. The second, uh, I'll repeat again, and because when I cover these, there's a lot of things that kind of jumble together, so I may, be, I may repeat myself, but it's back to uh, a private placement you can sell to pre-existing, you can advertise to people, customers, past customers, people with pre-existing relationships, but you can't advertise to the general public at large only with pre-existing relationships. With a direct public offering, which is a registered offering, you can advertise direct to everyone. You can use newspaper advertisements, etc. Does that answer that question? Yeah. Social media. Can you use LinkedIn as a pre-existing relationship? Uh, I've actually, I'm on LinkedIn also. I haven't put up my profile yet, but I watched their Q and A's and someone asked that question and some of the responses were yes. The SEC has not said something about it. So the general consensus is that is a pre-existing relationship until there is a ruling that says no. So the question is how do you protect your IP in the process when you're advertising, you know, mass? So let me start with um, I have not ever had a problem with that. Now, first off, that's a little bigger conversation, but let's, what, what do we have for time? Do we have five more minutes? Ten more minutes? Ten minutes. Okay, so I'm gonna give, I'm gonna give you a little more on that. First, it, it falls under the category of how to create excitement around IP. And also it falls under the category of creating um, the illusion and the reality, but a lot is illusion also, around you are a force of nature with so much protection that no one wants to come after you. And here's the secret to that. You file provisional patents and you do them yourself. Now, sec secret, that's, the, that's the cheapest secret. The second cheapest secret, which is the way uh, I've done it, is you put an ad on Craigslist 
for patent agents $15 an hour and you say, I'm looking for patent agents, and I will tell you, in any economic time, especially now, you, you'll be amazed at how you can advertise for very competent help at very little money. So $15 an hour, put an ad in for a patent agent. You hire the patent agent part-time. She, she or he can work out of their homes or in your office, and you have them look for provisional patent possibilities. When you put out in your advertisements, as I did for AeroGrow, at one time I had 16 patent pendings. You don't put 16 provisional patent pendings. It's 16 patent pendings. So that's a scary proposition for a competitor. So buried within one of those might be one you're really secretive about and sensitive. But no one's going to, first of all, no one can access all these 16 patent pendings until until they're released. It's exactly. So basically, get a lot of patent pendings and don't worry about it. And, and then also when you're advertising, talk about the benefit. Don't talk about the intricacies. Find out what the benefit is of your patent and say, patent pending and here's what the benefit is. So it's giving away very little, but getting a lot of exciting sex appeal exposure. Because that's a good, the delicate balance between giving away too much, but not enough. True. So you find the words in the language. So the question is, consumer product, comp, uh, consumer oh. product. you have a low-tech consumer product, and uh, there's, it, there are known barracudas in the water <laughs> that will look at your idea, take it to, to China, and duplicate it very quickly, and how do you deal with that? I have had to deal with that a number of times, meaning I've had to deal with that threat. My last company, AeroGrow, uh, we developed the world's first kitchen crop appliance known as the AeroGarden. It was a consumer product, allows you grow organic herbs and vegetables in your kitchen year round. Consumer product. So that consumer product uh, was vulnerable. Um, and I will come back to that in a moment. A previous company was voice power technology where I developed the world's first voice recognition or handheld VCR remote control that allowed you to program VCRs by voice commands. So you'd speak to it, record channel 7 Tuesday 7 p.m. to 9 p.m., put it in the middle of the room, it would uh, turn on your VCR at the right time and turn it to the right channel. And this was before TiVo and this was like a really cool thing back in its day. So both of those I had to raise a lot of money for. So AeroGrow I did I raised $5 million, I, I raised $5 million through investor direct offerings, combination of private placements and a direct public offering. Uh, and I faced that problem. Here's my best advice to you. Most of the time, and I'm saying most of the time, that threat is a bigger conversation about it than it is in fact a threat. Until the products hit the market and it's wildly successful, they generally don't do it. Now, it's true, there are exceptions. It's true, there are horror stories about Mattel coming up with a new toy, they show, and three days later, you know, it's somewhere. That's Mattel coming up with a new toy. It's not you coming up with, uh, quote, a, an interesting widget that sounds interesting, but until it's successful, most people won't go after it. So there's, you know, if you think about survival and you think about, uh, at personal level, oxygen first, and then I think it's uh, water. <laughs> you know, who said so? Somebody say sex? Oh, right, okay. So, uh, and then it's food, and then it's shelter, and then it's sex, somewhere in that area. Uh, so oxygen is survival, get the money, okay? Get the money and, and, and roll the dice. Most of the time it won't happen until you're successful. Do you know it took, it's only in this last year, and I started developing uh, the Aero Garden in 2002. I spent three and a half years developing the technology and 
Every time I went to raise money, people say, well, what about knockoffs? And I, and I was able to overcome it. I said, I don't think we'll see a knockoff for four or five years. We only today, in the, this year, started seeing knockoff. Before that, so I had from, you know, at least uh, four or five years of no knockoffs, even with it being uh, successful. Actually, it's not true because we didn't launch it until 2006, 2007, three years. So I had three years before we saw a knockoff. Now, one last thing on that, which is, I also integrated some stuff that made it trickier to knock off. So I had, for example, a grow lab, and I was testing all kinds of different plants, and you can't duplicate that very easily. Uh, so there were certain things that I threw in it that made it a tad more complicated. So let me see if I understand your question. Are you, uh, you're asking, how does this work if you're in the process of negotiating with VCs and angels? As a general rule, here's how I do it. When you, if, if you are going to negotiate with angels and VCs, the more you can put pressure on them because you have alternatives, the better your chance of getting that. So if all you did was start a direct public offering for the threat, that is in itself enough to create momentum. It, it's do this or get off the pot, you know, so to speak. So uh, it puts pressure on them and gives you an advantage, a negotiation advantage. The question is, how does this work? You know, what, what am I really saying? You know, we've, I'm covering a lot of broad territory. What's the specifics of, say, what I recommend or, or whatever? First, it does, have to do with the, the, it, it does have to do with the companies in general. But let me give you two camps of companies. Company camp number one, very little <coughs> money to raise money with. Don't have a lot of marketing money. I suggest they do and work with them to do a 504 first. Let's get in $25,000, $100,000 quickly. Use that for marketing your direct public offering. If I have a company that already is up and going, they have cash flow, they have some little bit amount of cash, we might bypass the 504 private placement and go right to a direct public offering. That's, that's generally how I do it. One more question? Okay, so the question. If, you're, if you are going after non-accredited investors, do you still need a PPM? So two, two answers to that question. First of all, if you're doing a 504, 505 or 506, which is a Reg D or a private placement, using all that language together as synonymous, yes, well, okay, if you had, the answer is yes, you need a private placement, period. End of conversation. If you were doing a 504 and there was a sophisticated investor and you were going to raise a half million dollars, you would not need a Reg D. Uh, but generally, if you're going after unaccredited investors in a private placement, you will need a, you will need a private pl placement memorandum. I'm going to cover some more details specifically. There are four different ways you can structure, structure an investor direct offering. Number one, there's debt. Debt is, you know, the benefits of debt, basically it's a loan. You're asking people to make a loan. And oftentimes I will recommend that as your first offering, your first offering to family and friends. A couple of benefits. Number one, you don't have to give up any stock. Number two, it's easier to sell your story often. If, you've got, if you haven't raised money before and you're like right out of the chutes, debt is the easiest way generally, maybe not always, but is an easier way to raise money um, because you're giving them interest payments and you're going to pay back the principal. The other benefit is you don't get into a question of valuation with debt. So it's not how much is your company valued. The downside, you have to pay interest and you got to pay the money back. That's not a good thing. Uh, but there's a second instrument that I like better than debt, which is uh, convertible debt. So it's still a debt offering to your family or friends, but if you meet certain milestones that you decide what those are, or if you do a direct public offering, or anything you put in there, it converts automatically to equity. 
So that's a good thing. So it means it's debt for a little while, and if you're successful, it converts to equity. That's called convertible debt. The benefit, it has the potential to be debt only for a short period of time, and it's the, sometimes the best of both worlds because investors get debt to begin with that converts to equity when, the, when you're offering or when your business looks more promising. So it's good for them and good for you. When the economic times are tougher, debt or convertible debt is easier to raise. <laughs> However, there's a special kind that I have become uh, kind of a specialist in that I like a lot and that's royalties. Very few people have heard about royalty funding. And you can use royalties in either a private placement or a direct public offering. And basically royalties are like this. Let's say you want to raise a million dollars. You raise, I'm making this up for the moment just for simplicity. You get 10 investors at $100,000 each. Again, making that up. And that, those 10 investors, you will give a percentage of future sales to that investor group for, no, not for stock. In other words, you're just giving a royalty stream out. And until the investors get a certain return on their investment, the way I looked at it, the way I've done it, is until they get three times return on their investment. And I put a fixed amount of time. This is a royalty for X number of years until you get three times your investment back. And then after that, the royalty drops down to a much smaller percentage for X number of years. That's an exciting alternative where, A, you're not paying interest on a large amount of money because you're only paying when sales come in. You're giving up no stock. And it... It offers the investor cash flow and an upside on your sales. So there's a lot of good things about uh, royalties. No ownership dilution, no principal to pay back, cash flow. Uh, the royalties distributed as income may accrue as tax, ben tax benefits to the company. And you, you only pay until, you don't pay anything until you have sales and as sales grow, payments increase. Therefore, you don't have much in sales. You, don't, you pay out very little. The downside to royalties. If the company takes off, your royalties may cost you more than debt. So um, the other thing you want to do on a royalty structure is you want to have a buyout clause in case your company gets acquired. You don't want that, that is a that's a negative to a company that might acquire you. So you put a buyout clause in your royalty structure that you can buy the royalty, you can buy that out for less money if you do it quickly. 